Paul Howard is a Los Angeles-based filmmaker, writer, and activist. He is the director of the online documentary series, Anne Asks, and its complimentary feature-length film, A Pebble in the Pond. Paul endeavors to create content that is inspiring, positive, and empowering. His free-to-watch YouTube series, Anne Asks, starring Anne Benson, is a show that believes in people and the good we can do when we take action. His latest film, A Pebble in the Pond, is a documentary about an organization called the Assistance League and the good work they do helping children in need. The film wants you to be inspired to ask, how can I create ripples too? Please welcome Paul Howard. Welcome to the show, Paul Howard. I'm really happy to have you on. Thanks for doing this. I'm excited. <laughs> yep. All right. So the first question I want to start with, uh, the obvious question is, how did you get into filmmaking? Um, is that something that uh, came to you early on uh, as a child that you were very interested in? Uh, did you see a movie that perhaps inspired you or uh, is it just something that just kind of came out of the blue? I think a little bit of a couple of things. Um, obviously, film has been a part of my life as many people. And um, I remember seeing Disney films, um, you know, as a kid and found them very dynamic. But I was always interested in telling stories and I'm theater trained. And so in uh, junior high and high school, I started to get more involved with theater and taking lessons, um, you know, in like vocal lessons or dance lessons. And so I would say I started in the theater, not so much film, um, although I've always liked the genre of film, music videos, probably more specifically, I'm a music guy. And so uh, you know, Madonna and Michael Jackson and all these, um, to me, true artists who told stories with their music videos really was something dynamic to me. I didn't equate music videos with film initially because I was young. And so it was just like, oh, this is cool. I love this music and dance and story. Um, but I think ultimately I was attracted to, you know, telling stories through the medium of film. Um, but it was only after high school and then into college, which I um, got my degree in drama from UC Irvine, that I started to see the power of film and um, started thinking differently. Theater, I love the theater, but it's it can be, it's very competitive, like filmmaking, like acting, like everything else. And again, I started as an actor. So I just was like, am I going to go to New York and audition for theater and then if you book something, how long, you know, doing the same thing didn't, wasn't so exciting to me, having smaller audiences, whereas if you did something online or a film, potentially you have thousands, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of people that you can get to. Um, and the theater is a much more intimate experience, which again, I love, but um, I started thinking differently about that. So yes, I've always liked film and been drawn to it, I think, even when I didn't fully know um, what elements I was drawn to. But no, I didn't like start out going, I'm going to be a director. You know, what I mean, that was not I was much more and and, you know, continue to pursue kind of being in front of the camera. Um, and so that's how it started for me. OK, yeah. So, I mean, would you always say you've been creative? Um, yes, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I remember in our one interview, you talked about like uh, creating little puppet shows uh, for yeah. your parents. Yeah, yeah I uh, um, I did this thing called the Safety Friends, which you know I was I I was in elementary school. I'm not exactly sure how old I was, but you know I was pretty young, and I I was a horrible artist, unlike you. Um, I could not draw or paint or do any of that. I have never had skills in that arena, but I drew little characters, and I actually had my brother help me, and he, my younger brother, he made a character to but I like cut them out and they were essentially like two-dimensional like I would just kind of like doo -doo -doo, you know have them be but I created a set and I had a backdrop and in the backdrop I had like 
I remember for one, there were like explosions. And so I drew like explosions and I pasted them to like the backdrop. So, it, so I was, as a kid, I kind of had an inherent understanding of theater and like the, the idea of perspective. And so those things, for whatever reason, I don't know where I learned it. It just was something that I instinctually kind of understood and would put on shows. And my parents would, you know, sit and watch and I would have characters come out from backstage. I always had an understanding of kind of theater world, which I don't really know why, because <laughs> I was not, I don't think, I, I think the first like proper show I saw was probably junior high. I mean, so I didn't even see theater as a kid. Um, but yeah, so I started with Safety Friends and um, really liked telling the stories. And I would write the script and then, you know, I'd play the different characters and like have them do their little things. And, you know, um, so yes, I definitely have always been creative. And I think now looking back, I've always wanted to tell stories. I've always wanted to entertain people in a very specific way, because I think some people love just the limelight and some people like sculpting or some people like painting like I think for me it's always been about story and it's really come full circle for me now with the stuff that I do in regards to Anne Ass or Pebble in the Pond it's being able to tell stories that I'm passionate about and present uh, people or organizations that I think are doing extraordinary work so it's interesting how it kind of goes the full the full circle the full uh, you know gambit yeah yeah, I can say the same for myself. Storytelling is probably the most important uh, part for me, even though I do painting and, you know, uh, illustration work, uh, you know, for me, it's it's the story that's behind it that's that's most important to me. Right. So as far as filmmaking goes, I mean, what was like the first major project you really ever worked on? I, um, I did multiple things as an actor um, and, you know, was on screen for multiple things. But the first, uh, like, like I was a producer or involved in that kind of way was a short film called Sauce. Um, and at the time, my roommate and I wrote it off of a real situation. It's, it's kind of a random story, but I went to Taco Bell and... You, I would, I would go to Taco Bell fairly often. I love, I still to this day love Taco Bell, but I try not to go as often. Um, and, you know, it was cheap food and good. And so that's why I went. It was the, you know, just after college years. And um, I went to the drive through and would always say, can I have extra, you know, hot sauce or fire sauce or whatever. And I'd always get home with the food and there'd be like three, you know, and I'm like, <laughs> and so this one day I get home, my roommate's there. And I pull out literally one sauce. And I'm like, are you kidding me? You know, it was like, I had specifically asked for extra and I get one. And it kind of like morphed into, I, I can't remember if it was him or I who said like, this would be kind of a funny short film, this idea of, um, you know, and it grew in the storyline, which I won't say in case people want to go watch it online because it is online right now. But um, the, sh the short grew out of that original idea and we did it properly. We had a director who was a friend of my roommates and we, you know, paid, it, it was like the first thing that I really produced and I'm very proud of it, even though it's many years old now. Um, but we, you know, we shot on locations, it was multiple day shoots. It, I learned a ton because things went wrong that could go wrong. I learned about like the roles of the director and various people. Cause I was only, I wrote, co-wrote it with my roommate and um, ended up producing the film eventually. Cause it took, you know, a long time to finish it. Um, Cause I was learning all these things, but it was such invaluable information. Um, and I'm so glad that happened because it was a, it was a, you know, probably five years before I started more regularly doing what I now do. Um, because it was such a learning curve, you know, you had to kind of learn like all the moving pieces and, and I learned right away all the obstacles in film, you know, um, and one of the things I pride myself on and, you know, you can speak to and others can is I do what I say I'm going to do and I finish projects and I think a kind of epidemic in our uh, industry is things don't get finished, they don't necessarily get started but things get started and then they don't get finished or it takes like astronomical seven years to do. And I'm like, no, 
like I'm much more like we got to finish this we got to get it done um because I want to I think partly it's personal I just want to move on to the next thing like I'm like great this was cool I love it but I want to do other things but the other part for me is why do something if you're not going to do it a hundred percent if you're not going to do it you know the best you can do it and if you're not going to finish it you know so yeah that led me um, into then starting to do these smaller short films by myself and still relying on teams of people, which I'm very fortunate, you know, because often, uh, you know, people didn't get paid or it wasn't for the money. It was never those things. It was kind of like, it's what I would say. It was probably what I would have done had I gone to film school. It's like, it was my film school. Like I would get my friends to do stuff for free and, you know, I'd, I'd beg for favors. I'd be like, oh, can we film at your house? And, you know, like do all that stuff. And I started that process as I grew as a filmmaker and started to like clarify, okay, how do you get these things done? And, and like anything, it's steps. You go, okay, this time I'm going to like, you know, I'm going to get permits. And this time I'm going to like pay people. And this time I'm going to have a larger team. And you just keep kind of growing based on each project. Um, and that's all, like I said, led to me to really an ass was the thing that I would say exponentially exploded where I am now because it's it was really seeing how I could combine all of my passions, including my activism, into one thing. Um, and it's why that's how I found you, which I love. You know, you're short. Um, I I forget the name of it with the fish. Uh, helping what? hand. What helping is it? Hand. Helping uh, hand. Yeah which I, I loved, like love, love, loved. And I saw that and I was like, okay, I, I not only love the animation, but I love the intent and the story. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna reach out and you know see if they'd be interested in working because I didn't know any details at that point. Um, but it's because I think that's important. Like you were saying story, you know, is having that story be there. And then there being a larger intent beyond just like ego or, hey, I made something or, or let me just show you how cool I am because th that happens too in our industries and that's cool. But I always wanted to kind of touch people, inspire them, uh, provoke them, educate them. And so I saw that in your film and I strive for that and try to work with people who are like-minded. Yeah. And we'll definitely talk about Anne Asks in a little bit, but staying okay. on the filmmaking uh, part, uh, at least in your beginnings, uh, I'm curious, uh, was, what, were there any really difficult challenges you had as a beginner filmmaker? Were there any uh, moments where you can remember that things looked very difficult or you made some mistakes uh, along your way uh, to get to where you are today? Oh, sure. I think that's a little bit of the nature of the beast going back to sauce. You know, we, it was a two day shoot. And on the second day, we literally ran out of time. Like we, we had not filmed a large swath. And these were things that I started to understand, like scheduling and the director's role and producers, or, you know, if you are producing or if you have multiple producers, because it was very like real world, we ran out of time in our location and we ended up essentially doing like a green screen in the director's <laughs> apartment and had to like fake out these last scenes that were between me and my roommate who were in the in the film and you know it, we made it work thankfully but it took a ton of extra work to to make it right and it was an important lesson to me of like don't go in naively don't go in like oh it's all gonna work out because it doesn't just work <laughs> out or at least for me I can't speak for others but my life is not a life that's just like oh yeah it's, it, it all worked out fine <laughs> like there's there's there were challenges so and I think every piece you kind of learn what that's what I was saying about the stepping each thing you you learn oh not gonna do that and they're not always like tragedies or some huge thing but you just keep tucking away like okay that that didn't work out great or ooh, I could have done that better um and I keep moving so yes I mean I would say there have been times but um you know you recover and you keep moving and you know and you hopefully can salvage because there's times where something gets filmed and you you can't finish it you know I mean that yeah. happens too so yeah I definitely want to ask uh because 
you, your, your content, at least the, the newer films that you've made in the last couple of years, you definitely focus on trying to tell a more positive story uh, about the world, the people themselves, and you know, you're trying to create positive content. Um, I'd like to ask where that came from. Why do you want to make positive content? Why do you think it's important? Um, I think I've, I've always been an optimist and an idealist. I am very pragmatic, which makes me a good uh, producer, I think. But I, I am, at my heart, optimistic. And that goes back to like the Disney films I saw as a kid. Like I 100% believed in those worlds. Like the world that represented about the misfit, or the idea that you're a nobody and you can become a somebody if you work, like those kinds of themes for me, I just immediately gravitated towards. And I think it has you know, a lot to do with multiple aspects of my childhood and just probably my DNA. So I've always been somebody who has an optimistic heart and view of the world and has a hopeful um, view in, about humans and situations. Um, but what really spawned, I think, like you said, the last couple of years was um, the election in 2016. Um, it felt like everything became very divisive and um, a lot of really dark vitriol. And, um, and I'm not passive in life in many ways, I could say that. And, I, and so I thought, OK, what can I what can I do? Like, what action can I take? And so in 2017, I started like, you know, reaching out to people I had been connected to and asking them if, you know, they wanted to collaborate on things because I was still in that phase of like trying to collaborate a lot as opposed to just doing stuff and bringing people into my teams, which is more, you know, how I work now. And Ann Benson was a friend who I had worked with multiple times on multiple shorts of mine. Um, and I said, you know, let's do lunch. And I had this whole idea, like this comedy series to pitch her to get involved. And we would sit down and one of the first things she says, she's like, I don't want to do comedy. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, that was my whole pitch and idea. So we start talking and we had a lot of similar feelings about the world, about the election, about, you know, the situation we were in. And so we began really about wanting to have a conversation with people, like to understand them. And that was the first kinds of things that we filmed for Ann Ass. And then um, her friend, David Zimmerman, was um, connected to Performing Arts Studio West, which is a school for actors with disabilities. It's like singing and dancing. And, and so they were like, do you wanna come and do an episode and interview? And so Ann and I, of course, were excited and, and that day, I would say, really set us into a totally different motion because, as I said, we'd kind of started with content that was a bit more, like, a little bit more politically inclined, a little bit more about, like, understanding why people did stuff. And this episode is what became what it is. Our, it's considered now our first Anne Ass. It's what I consider our first Anne Ass episode because it took us in, like, a whole new, totally different direction um, because of the people. We interviewed the students and they were so uh, powerful and insightful and dynamic. And I think both Anne and I were kind of, um, you know, I think we all have biases in our life and we thought, oh, well, this is going to go a certain way. And these, these people, you know, are going to talk a certain way or think a certain way. And we were challenged right away in how um, inspiring they were. And we were both, I think on set, it was one of those things where you could feel we were both like, and we'd get the next interview and start talking to the next person, just be like, you know, we were blown away by every person. Um, and David and John, who are at the school who we interviewed also are amazing men and have been doing it for a long time and, you know, doing really good work. And so it got me really thinking how many more people are out there like this, doing amazing work, touching people's lives, inspiring change quietly without any kind of accolade or celebration. And I think that's what really then kind of took us in the direction of the series that we now do of Ann Ass and wanting to tell a, a good story, but it's more than that. It's, you know, sharing what people are normal people everyday people these are not 
special or extraordinary or what we like to think of like, oh, this isn't, you know, Taylor Swift or, you know, like these are just people doing amazing things and changing our world with their, with their love, with their actions, with their art, with their time, with their efforts, you know, with a bunch, depending on who it is, with a bunch of things. And I thought there's something to this, you know, and yeah, I just love the reaction is what obviously helped us continue it because people were like so blown away by you know the vibes and the feeling good and the stories and I think were not only touched personally but then were also uh, inspired to do stuff in their own life and and we've heard many stories of people who have started groups or have you know signed up to volunteer or have thought about things differently in a way that they never did um, and I think as an artist, I mean, I'm like, and I'm done. You know, I mean, that's really, that's, that's the goal for me as an artist. I can't speak for all artists, but for me, that's the goal is to, to lead, to impact your audience, to make them think differently. I, you know, to me, that's, yeah. there's nothing, there's nothing more. Yeah. I mean, that was my next question was how Anne asked came about. You kind of already uh, explored that a bit, but I guess, um, yeah, I mean, how did, how did some of the episodes come about? How did you find the people that you did? You know, if you could explore a little bit about that. Sure. I, um, it's using your resources. Like the first episode, David was friends with Anne and she, you know, they're close friends. And so that was through contacts. And then um, LA Kitchen, which was the second episode. I'm actually trying to think. I can't remember if I just found it and then reached out, I think it is, I think we, I started doing, again, I'm a social media guy, and I'm also like a get onto Google, and just start typing in things, and looking for stuff, and I'm pretty sure LA Kitchen, I came across like an article, or something on it, and as I investigated it more, I was like, we definitely have to talk to these people, and they were very gracious, and, um, and when I reached out to them, emailed me back right away, and were, you know, happy to help, um, and then, Tabitha, which was the third episode, was a friend of Anne's, and so we had connected, and I think they went, I think it was something random, like um, they took a yoga class together or something, like Anne had befriended her through that, and um, and then the fourth episode, I think, was again me seeking um, stories, um, and it was the actors who do um, entertain at like a, at a senior facility um, every Friday, I think it was, that they would then entertain them um, and they were all actors. And so it was like a great one to explore because they were using their artistry, but then, you know, getting to like perform, which is of course an actor wants to have those opportunities, but using it in a way that touched people's lives that made them feel not alone or, you know, because some people don't have family or don't have family visit them. And so every day can feel like Groundhog Day. And I love the idea of them going in and like shaking it up and exciting people. So yeah, they've all been uh, a combination of things, but I'm a huge advocate for research. It's how I, you know, found um, you know, uh, multiple things that I've done. And then and then it's just asking your friends and family for the assistance league, which became a pebble in the pond. That was through my friend, Linda, who has since unfortunately passed away. And she was connected to the assistance league and, you know, worked with their prom days. And she was like, you have to go check out operation school bell. Um, you're just going to be blown away. And I'm so glad I did because Anne and I went and it's what, you know, brought you yeah. and I now together. You know, it's like, I love that. I love the progression of like how people come into your universe yeah. and, you know, I just think it's cool. <laughs> yeah. So as far as um, a pebble in the pond goes, I mean, yeah. How did that come about? And I mean, what made you decide this has to be a feature documentary? Well, first shout out to your beanie. Cause I love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a pebble in the pond, uh, like I said, my um, friend, Linda, I, I had put out a post, I think on Facebook saying, I'm looking for 
nonprofits, groups, individuals who are doing amazing, good work, you know, please share. And she reached out to me, I, I want to say very quickly about the Assistance League, and I had never heard of them. And actually, I think she specifically reached out about Operation School Bell, which is a, one of their programs. So I didn't even know really about the Assistance League. It was just Operation School Bell. And I reached out, and again, the LA chapter was very gracious and, you know, excited. And we were invited to go to Universal Studios, which is down the street from me, um, to basically observe um, it happen, you know, and see what it was all about. And so Anne and I went, and like a, a bit of a side story, I had been leaning towards, because at this point we had done four-ish episodes, and I am, as I said earlier, who I am, and so I wanted to keep growing. And so I had been thinking about something, a longer format, something, maybe not a feature, but I definitely was thinking in terms of like, okay, I want to expand what I'm doing. I want to do something fuller. So that was already kind of in the back of my mind. Well, Anna and I get there and it's a, you know, it's an amazing operation as you're now well aware of. Um, and we see the kids getting shoes, brand new shoes for the first time. And I mean, both Anna and I were like, you know, like crying and like, because you're just overwhelmed by these kids who are beautiful little souls who are just so excited to be there and just like in awe of like getting clothes and shoes and backpacks. And you're just like, oh, I can't take it. It's like, you know, it's like so amazing. And uh, it really is an experience. I cannot, I, I wanted the, I hope the film at least gives a little bit of that touch to the audience because for me and Anne, it was so magical you know what i mean to not sound cliche but it really was magical you just are like so ann and i walk away and we're i'm walking her back to her car and i'm right away like my creative wheels are spinning i'm like oh my god we have to do this we have to film this it's like great and, and i'm like i'm thinking and i said and she can she can back me up on this at that time like minutes after i walked away i said i think there's a bigger story here i think this is a feature and you know she was like great i'm on board let me know and as I started researching, um, and, I, and I, it took a long process, you know, and as I started filming with the Assistance League, that's when I started discovering they have other chapters. I started, you know, learning about Ann Banning and, um, you know, Ruth Ann Montgomery and all of the women who have, you know, created and all of their history. And that's when, like, it was like, okay, and, you know, brought in, I wrote the script actually um initially the concept I had in my head was I would have it be told by the people the members of the assistance league instead of animation it was like I would have it kind of like chalked of like you would tell part of the story and then somebody else would tell part of it so I always had the idea of telling it in pieces but then very quickly I thought this would be cool animated and then being a logistic guy. Cause I was like, how am I going to produce this? Cause I cannot get one animator to do, you know, I think it ends up being 30 minutes of animation. So I mean, it's a big chunk of animation. It's like, I'm not going to be able to get one animator to do 30 minutes for, for free. You know, it's like, so um, that's when I started thinking about breaking it into chapters and essentially having different styles of animation, different um, types of animators to kind of tell the story um, that I thought was very organic in the way that the Assistance League is a patch quilt of different people and different actions that have, you know, led them to where they are today. So that is the extended story of Devil in the Pond. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, did the film have a crowdfunding? It did. We, um, as I, I filmed... I can't remember how many days, but we filmed X amount of scenes and days. And then we did a Kickstarter. Um, and I had done, I've done, I've probably done six or seven Kickstarters through my whole career. And um, most of them have been successful. A couple of them have not, you know, so I've, I've experienced getting it and not. Um, and I thought as we were kind of like ramping up, to essentially finish the film, there was just a lot of logistic costs you can't call out favors for and you can't get done for free and you can't keep it on the timeline because that was my thing is I was always like moving us forward. Like we have to get it done. We have to keep moving and, and closing things. And so I thought 
I'm willing to try a Kickstarter because it's a lot of work. The first thing I'd say, if anybody's watching and cares to hear this, you know, Kickstarters can be amazing. Kickstarters or any crowdsourcing can be an amazing tool, but there also can be a lot of work. Um, and I think to do them successfully, you're going to put in a bit of work. So um, I kind of prepped Anne and my team as to like, okay, I'm thinking about doing this, but we're going to have to really promote it. And we're going to have to do, you know, we did events every day and I called out a ton of favors and, you know, and like my friend, Michelle, who does the goat yoga, she donated a goat yoga class. I mean, you know, there were lots of people who stepped up to give us the prizes and things that people could win. LA Kitchen and Robert, he gave us stuff. So I really, um, Tabitha in episode, you know, three, like we, I asked for a lot of favors and people, you know, stepped up and did that. And it was what allowed us to raise um, funds to kind of finish the film basically. Um, because there's just, like I said, certain logistics you can't do <laughs> without money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, a, that's awesome. Uh, that's an awesome story. And the film's really good. Uh, it was a really great film. I don't think I've gotten to talk to you since I actually saw the film myself. But yeah, I mean, it's a really great film. And uh, yeah. I, I hope many people get inspired and enjoy this film. Now, the film is currently at film festivals right now, correct? Right. COVID happened. We had been doing film festival or we'd been like beginning that process. And we have, we were accepted to a few and have won a few awards, but it's a weird time right now. And so I've stopped submitting or I had stopped submitting obviously during COVID. And so now I'm really looking to get distribution for it. Um, the, the goal is to get it so people can go watch it. Um, and while there are resources, like you can just put it on these websites and stuff, I really would rather get it somewhere legit, um, you know, like a streaming service that um, people can see because the whole point of it is to encourage people to tell this story, but also inspire them to create ripples of their own. Um, one of the things that I have gotten feedback of the film, and I don't know if you agree, but it it's very much about encouraging people to create their own ripples and, and reminding people that it doesn't take an army and it doesn't take a ton of money and it doesn't take some special skill that you, you, the audience member, you can make a difference, even in small ways, you can impact the world. And I'm very proud of that message. And I think it's a timely message too. Um, I feel like, uh, you know, in my humble opinion as the director, I feel like it's a great film to have on a streaming service to encourage people to give them something that's like entertaining and educational, but like makes you feel good. You know, yeah. like I, I just think, and I get, I watch tons of documentaries. I love documentaries, but sometimes you're just like, ah, you know, it's just like, it's like rip your soul out. You're just like exhausted. So, yeah. What are you working on currently? And uh, where are you going uh, from here on out? So I um, recently released Rooted in Community, which is an Ann Ass inspired um, short, which is about grassroots neighbors, a very grassroots organization that is feeding neighbors in their, uh, like feeding people in their neighborhood. And I love it because it's again, a continuation of, it just takes you deciding to, to do something. And Stephanie who runs it is, you know, like she just was like, that people needed food. And so she just started taking action. I assume much like anything in life, it's just one foot in front of the other and you kind of start to do stuff, but it's amazing. And she has like great support now and great people there. Um, and so it was a fun story to cover. Uh, so that's the most recent thing. So people can go check that out at my YouTube or I'm sure you're gonna share links and stuff, but um, Grassroots Neighbors, it's a rooted in community. It's a short film. And then um, we'll definitely do another Ann Ass. Um, Ann and I have been talking. We've been talking about a couple of different organizations that we're considering. Um, so we'll do another Ann Ass with Ann because it's been a while since we've been able to do that, again, because of COVID and stuff. So we're ready to be able to um, do another Ann Ass. And then my big news is I just launched WeCreateRipples.com, which is kind of um, my way of creating a more sustainable business model for what we do and a way to help nonprofits or organizations tell their story in cinematic, dynamic, story-based ways. Because so often, 
I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but like I'll go to a nonprofit that I've, I'm researching, and I've heard about, and you get to their page and it's like, hasn't been updated since like 1997 or something, <laughs> you know, and you're like, it's like, you know, doot, 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 like it's like Pong basically. And it's, you know, super old and I get it. I'm not a, I'm not a tech guy, but it's like so out of date or they'll, you'll get a video and it's like somebody like, like a hostage video, they're getting against a white wall and they're like, I love this organization. And you're like, <laughs> Okay, it just, it, you know, and I make a light, I mean, I'm, I'm being a little dramatic, but it's true. Like I see some of these things and I'm like, God, you're doing amazing work. Put a little bit into the presentation. Yeah, more, more effort into the social marketing of, you know, your organization. So then people actually want to come, <laughs> exactly. come and help. Yeah. And, and I mean, that's, that's the thing that we do as artists. Is we tell stories. So I get, I'm, I don't expect, they're doing the amazing work or they're running the nonprofit or all the things that they have to do, but this is what I do. And so I can look at an organization and say, okay, these are the things that are dynamic, or these are the things that are interesting, or these are the things that are going to bring people into the fold because it is about extending with more volunteers, more donors, more money, whatever, you're going to be able to do more of what you do. Again, whatever it is, if you're giving clothes to, you know, kids or if you're feeding people or um, there's a million things out there. And it is amazing because I got to tell you, there's a lot of stuff out there that's amazing and people doing amazing work. I just feel like so often it's kind of lost in the woods. And if, if people aren't going to share, because that's the other component, if people aren't going to share the thing that you've created or the story you're trying to tell, you're not going to bring in other people. You're just going to continue to kind of like talk to your same network of people. And I'm really of the mindset of like, bring in strangers, bring in people that yeah. you've never heard because they can become now valuable parts of the community. And a perfect side note, which I've told the story before, and I might have said to you before, but um, when we had a screening of A Pebble in the Pond in 2019, um, there was a woman in the audience who had never heard of Assistance League, literally never heard of anything about them. And she watched the film and the next day she went to her local chapter of the Assistance League, which wasn't even one of the Assistance Leagues we had in the film. She, and she signed up and she's still there. She works in their thrift shop. She's like donated multiple hours of you know, man hours, but also time. And I thought, I mean, that's, that's the thing, you know, like, that's just one example of somebody who's like, I, I want to be a part of this. I want to help them. I want to support them because I think a lot of people would help or would volunteer or would sign up or would donate 50 bucks or whatever if they knew about it. But if, you know, if they've never heard of it. Yeah. Presentation is very important. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. And telling, telling a story, I think. I, I think that's why, you know, and this is one of the things, I don't know if you've had a chance to check it out yet, but the website, we create ripples.com, you know, there I talk about, we can do animation because I think depending on who you are or what the story is, sometimes you don't, you don't need to film with people. You don't need to have interviews. Like sometimes it's about a visual or telling a very like specific story that could be told through animation. So the possibilities are endless, you know, it's like, and there's not a one size fits all, like you're this size nonprofit or you're, you know, this kind of nonprofit or you're located here, or you do this kind of work, all those things matter. Um, and you tell a different story based on what it is. And, you know, like for Assistance League, it's a feature film, not, I don't know if every, you know, nonprofit has that story, but I get, I guarantee there are some that do. Um, and so it's just this idea of, I'm excited to see how it goes. You know, I, I don't, you, you never know, you do stuff and you yeah. just kind of wait to see the reaction. <laughs> but um, I'm excited to see what comes of We Create Ripples because I think there's something there. Um, I certainly think, as I said, it's something sustainable that could, you know, really, because I would love to be able to have my, going back to the theater, theater thing, in theater, you're very much a family and, you know, there's summer stock and that's basically where there's, you know, for people who don't know, it's like, you know, 50 people and those 50 people do everything. Like you do multiple shows and you may be the lead in one and then you may be like a, a co-starring in another or you may do lighting and you may. And so it's this community where you can call on each other to support one another and to help one another or to work with. Again, my idea is to like be able to work with people. I want to be able to 
call you up and say, hey, I've got this thing. This is what I'm thinking. Like, are you interested and bring you in to be able to work on something yeah. else? The idea is why, why would I, I, you know, I'm going to work with the people I like working with. I'm going to work with the people who are of like minded or who I know I can rely yeah. on, you know? So <laughs> that's kind of the, that's the background of it is like that. I want to create a stable of people of a community who are of like-minded and will, um, you know, we'll see, cause it's easier. You and I is one example, you know, working on a piece together, we now have a language that we didn't have at the beginning because yeah. you kind of have to learn like how, yeah. how, how is Paul? Oh, he's crazy guy. <laughs> <laughs> he's got like lots of notes, you know, like you learn kind of why yeah. people are the way they are and then you evolve. And like I said, I, with you, it's like, I already knew a lot, I think because of your, of your short that I saw, but you then learn how people work and like what it, they need from you and how, I can be supportive too because it's a learning curve. I, I mean, just because I've done a million of these now doesn't mean I'm not still learning or evolving. I, with all the animators, I learned a ton about animation, about animators, about the process. And now I think I become better and better at working with animation, but also working with different people of different walks of life and different mindsets or different experiences. So for me, it's like win, 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 win. It's just all a good situation because I get to like evolve. I get to learn more. I get to help others evolve and learn. I get to create amazing content and do things that I'm passionate about. And to me, that's like pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Like what you mentioned about finding like-minded people to work with. I, I guess that's not really a question you can answer, but how do you find those like-minded people? How do you find those indiv individuals? I think you ask, you know, you reach out and um, it sounds like I'm not answering the question, but it's true. I think it's just really asking people um, in the same way that if you want to put, put creativity aside for a second, you want it to impact your community and you're like, there's a lot of trash on the ground. Well, there's a couple of things. You can just start picking it up. You can be the leader and lead by example and just start picking it up or you can reach out to your neighbors or to your friends, your family and say, hey, on Saturday, I'm going to go pick up trash. Would you like to join me? But I think it's as simple as doing and asking. We, you know, I'll go off on a side note for a minute. Um, I think we as a society have become a bit obsessed over how we feel and what we think. And while those things are, of course, important, yeah. they're not everything. To me, it is what you do that is actually the most important because you can be, uh, you know, as an extreme example, you can have hateful thoughts in your head, but if you never act upon those and all that you do is good, then it's working out for you. You know, <laughs> not do your thing. It's not what I advocate, but you know, do your thing, but it's what your actions are. And so how do you find people who are like-minded? You reach out, you ask for help, you ask for them to get involved. And then as a more logistic answer, I think I, I keep my eyes open and I use social media, as I said to you at the beginning, as opposed to it being something that uses me, I use it. So I, I search hashtags on Instagram. I know I'm probably like the only one who does, but I literally search like artist or animator or um, when I did, I needed a, a vocalist for um, Gingerbread Manable for the theme song. I wanted to redo it. And so I literally typed in like female vocalist or, you know, um, singer and just started going through people's like Instagram. And again, you can get a sense about people. I think how they present themselves. It's not everything because obviously people can present something that's not exactly true, but you get a sense of people. Like, what do they post? Is it a bunch of selfies, like all selfies? Well, Probably, probably not an artist that I'm looking for to work with. I don't know, yeah. maybe, but you know, you get a sense of stuff. And so I think it's just listening to your instincts, asking people for help, being honest about your needs. Like I, I feel, I feel that I'm very um, sincere and honest about what I'm doing. Yeah. And I try to bring people with me, but not get, um, you know, you don't know what's going to work out. And I, I, I get that people want to get paid and, you know, those are all important things, but I can't promise future. You know, I can only say yeah. these are the things I'm going to do. So, yeah. 
as some final uh, thoughts um, for the the newcomer filmmaker who is interested in making documentaries or anything you know film related. I mean, what 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 would your advice be for them? Um, I think kind of similar to your last question. Um, you know, reach out to people, ask for help. Um, you can ask them for logistic help. Like I get um, messaged often from essentially strangers who are like, can you tell me, you know, how you do this or how you do that? And I always try to uh, respond to people and take the time to give them when I can. Like sometimes yeah. it's like too much <laughs> or too specific. Yeah. Or it's something like, they're like, do you want to produce a script? I'm like, I'm, no, you know, like, that's not <laughs> quite how I roll, but um but, you know, I try to like answer them and support them. I think the other thing is, is like, make sure you're passionate about it. Make sure yeah. it's your story that you want to tell. Because number one, everyone needs to understand, even if you're fast like me, it's a long process. Yeah. And if you're not going to be able to stay with it through the good, the bad, the boring, you're, you're not going to be able to handle it. And so I think you have to be realistic about, do I care about this story that I can be with this story for months, years, you know, do I have a way to bring others on board because of my passion? Like, am I so excited to tell this story that I can bring others into the fold? Um, I think those are things you have to consider at the very beginning, but it also has to be something that you're passionate about. You can't fake yeah. it. You can't yeah. fake. I mean, I just think you can't fake film. You can't yeah. fake artistry you know if you don't care about the thing you're drawing or you're filming or you're writing or you're dancing or you're, you're singing if you don't care about it like I feel like there's there's some actors there's some people out there who can like skate by um because they're that talented but I think audiences especially from now again back to the filmmaking audiences instinctually have a sense when they're being you know, when it's BS or when they're being manipulated or when it's not sincere in the same way that audiences know when you mean what you're saying and believe in what you're sharing with them. And I think that's part of the success of Ann Ass or Pebble in the Pond is that I believe in everything presented in those projects because they are of my, my mindset, my belief system, my faith, whatever you call it it's mine and it's very honest and true. And so I think an audience may not know what they're responding to, but they know it's real. As they're watching it on their phone or on the movie screen, they know it's real. They know that it's coming from a place of authenticity and of passion and belief. And I think that goes a long way. So my advice to people who want to create content is do it. First of all, like do it. I think it's, I, I always am an advocate of people creating more art for the world. And documentaries especially, there is a billion stories that need yeah. to be said and told. But it's be you. Don't try to be something else. If you have a very specific storyline, you come from um, a reservation and or you come from this country or you were wealthy or you were poor or you were these things, be those things. Like tell your story. Come from that point of view because I think the more authentic you are, ironically, the more the audience relates to it. If you try to create something that's for everybody or is meant to fit into molds, I think audiences are like, meh. But if it's so specific to my story, the thing I want to tell, people relate to that and go, I, I think that, or I, yeah. I relate to that. Yeah, I mean, that, that's great advice, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> for the people watching, uh, tell them what is an asks and why should they watch it and why should they watch the documentary film once it's available? Um, an ass is a docu series on uh, YouTube and you can go to anass.tv to see our episodes. As I said, there are the main episodes which are with Ann Benson and then there are also, also these um, inspired by. Um, so we have probably like we have a, a fair amount of the, the various videos up there now. Not all of them are official episodes, but I would say if you want to be renewed in your faith in humanity, if you want to be inspired, if you want to have a smile brought to your face or to be literally told the opposite of what the news tells us every day, go watch Ann Ass because it is about reminding people of the good 
but not in a like a hokey way, reminding them the actions that people are taking in truly impacting others' lives, their community, and the world, I believe, because I don't, I think the ripple analogy is very important to me. You throw a pebble, something very small, into a pond, and those ripples go beyond where you can even see. And so you don't always know how far you um, can impact or, or how you will impact. Um, because also the ripples grow as they um, are start small and then they grow out and become very large, far-reaching things. So um, I think that Anas is just like a really feel-good series and place to to be or with like-minded people who believe in a better world and and not just believe in it, but believe in taking action and doing things to make it a better world. Yeah. Awesome. So where can people find you? And do you have any final words you'd like to leave the audience with? I would say um, people can find me um, various ways, but getpaulhoward.com is my personal website, anass.tv. Um, they can go to, or as I said, my newest, um, which I encourage everyone to go check out, especially if they're in a nonprofit or involved with nonprofits, is wecreateripples.com. Um, and I would say, I guess I would just kind of restate a little bit of what we've already said, which is that the world is what you make it in part. And the world is feelings and thoughts, but the world is made up of actions. And some of those actions are negative and have led us to the places that we have been led to. But a lot of them are innovative and dynamic and um, powerful and positive. And I truly believe that the smaller stories of people impacting their communities, their loved ones, their, um, their friends, their family are the more important story. We just don't hear about it that much because it's considered smaller. And so go out and impact the world like by choosing to do something, by taking an action, whether it is a small action of having bottled water in your car that you can give to somebody who is houseless or whether it's old, you know, holding a door open for somebody and telling them to have a good day. These actions do add up to something. And if, if it's a story that you're passionate about that you want to tell, do it. If it's making art, if it's like donating, um, you know, if it's like my friend Karis, I love this. I've totally encouraged her. Like she collects furniture that she'll see on the street and then she'll like repurpose it, which I think is amazing anyways. But I was like, you should do a bunch of them and then like auction them for like charity or something. Like, I think there's no limit to what we can achieve if we choose to do it. And if we move ourselves away from our quiet spaces where nobody yeah. else is, it's just, I think it's really my, my parting words would be to, to do it like life is short do it engage yeah connect create be dynamic be inspiring yeah thank you paul this has been a fantastic interview uh really enjoyed it good i'm glad and I, thank you again for doing it i think it's a great idea and i hope you continue to do it because you know there's a billion people out there that yeah. are doing great stuff why not talk about it and talk to them yeah i'm keeping lots of people in mind right now and i'm looking i'm always looking for more people Awesome. So thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for coming on. And I guess we will end things off here. Awesome. Well, th thank you. And I, have, I hope you have a good rest of your day. You too. To tell a really great story, you have to go back to the beginning, the origins to fully understand. I've met women very much like myself who want to do something for kids, who care about these kids' future and who've been doing it for years and years. I'm a newbie. I just found them. I had never heard of uh, the Assistance League. I didn't know what Operation School Bell was. And I dare say that most people don't. And she took the panties and held it up to her heart and said, I've never had panties of my own. And 
high school clothes and know that tomorrow when they go to school they're going to be smiling and happy with new clothes and new clothes. So it puts joy in our heart. You came to school as a kid, I was like, yeah, you know, and that's why I really like to come back and like give give back to the people who gave to me. Do you think they know that you're a police officer? We have our shirts and I wear my hat, but you know, I, I wanna show them a different side of law enforcement.